The Lord be with you. you. Will all please rise in body or spirit and join me in a responsive call to worship. Happy are those who walk in God's ways. Blessed are those who observe God's commandments. Faithful are those whose eyes are fixed on righteousness. Joyful are those whose hearts are filled with praise. Come, let us love the Lord our God. We come to worship the one who leads us in the ways of life. is loving and welcomes us whenever we seek him. In that trust, 
Let us confess our sins together, praying. Holy God, we confess that we bow before idols and have often turned our hearts from you. Our worship of power and devotion to comfort disorders our love of you and our neighbors. We seek your forgiveness and yet avoid the hard work of reconciliation. Forgive us, God, and mend what is broken, that we may be one with you. Amen. God is alive and at work, nurturing our growth, nourishing our needs, and reconciling us to one another. God hears the confessions of our hearts and forgives us generously. It is through God's amazing grace that we are forgiven and all God's children respond, thanks be to God. I'd like to invite any children who are here this morning, if they want to join me up front for our children's message. There's a lot to navigate around this morning. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you. Raise your hand if you have heard the word blessing before. Everybody's heard that word? Okay, good. Now, keep your hand raised if you think you know what the word blessing means. What is the definition of blessing? This, oh, thumbs down. Yes, it's a tricky word. Any ideas? It's when you pray. Yes, I love that definition of the word blessing. Any other ideas what blessing is about? It's a tricky one. So there's lots of different ways to understand the word blessing, and I think maybe the simplest way to put it is a blessing is anything that helps you feel God's love and God's grace. So sometimes a thing can be a blessing. So for example, if you were feeling sick, and there was medicine that would help you feel better. Do you think that medicine would be a blessing? Yeah, I think so, all right. And what about if you went to a trampoline park and you were jumping and jumping and jumping? Or if you're playing soccer and you're running and running and running and you get really hot and really out of breath and you're panting and you're panting, when you're really thirsty, what do you think would be a blessing in that moment? Something to drink, yeah, ideally some water, right? Yeah, okay, so things can be blessings. And sometimes a person can be a blessing, can help us feel God's love and grace. So for example, let's say that your mom or your dad broke their right foot and they couldn't drive. But you had a next door neighbor who said, I'll go pick up your groceries for you, or I'll drive so-and-so to soccer practice. Would that neighbor be a blessing to your family? Yes, absolutely. All right, sometimes a blessing is words that we say. And in the Bible, there's a specific passage that we often share with one another as a blessing. And it says, may the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. Are those words full of God's love and grace? Yeah, I think so. Okay, one last question. 
Do any of your families have a blessing that you say on a regular basis? Sometimes families have special words that they say at night before bedtime. Or you pray before you eat dinner. Absolutely, those are definitely words of blessing. So I love that there are so many kinds of blessings because it means there's lots of different ways that we can feel and experience God's love in our lives. So we are going to share words of blessing to close our children's message today instead of our regular prayer. So you all are going to leave this room and we're going to go out to Sunday school, right? And then all the grown-ups are going to stay here and keep worshiping. But is God going to be with us in all of those places? Yes. So I'm going to read the Bible verse again that I just shared as a blessing. And you don't need to repeat after me. You can just listen with an open heart. And when I say amen, I want you kids up here really loud to say to the grown-ups some words of blessing, which are, God be with you here. And I have a little sign here in case you can read it. And then the grown-ups are going to say words of blessing back to you. It's printed in your bulletin. And then we're all going to say together, God be with us everywhere. And I have another sign for that. Do you think, so should we practice it first? Okay, so what's your all's line of blessing to say? God be with you here. That's really good. And grown-ups, what are you going to say? Okay, and then all together we'll say, God be with us everywhere. Okay, good. I think we got it. So let me read the Bible verse, and then we'll say our liturgy together. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. God be with us everywhere. Amen. All right, let's go on back to Sunday. and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ, and welcome to this service of worship on this very special Sunday, maybe not so special in the life of the church, but very, very special in the life of the community. And I pray that, and based on the number of you, I saw Carlino's yesterday, everybody has plans this afternoon. I uh, want to extend a word of welcome also to those of you who are worshiping over radio station WCHE and streaming online. It is so good to be together. Um, If you have not done so already, there's some red friendship pads that are found closest to the center aisles of your pews. Pass them back and forth, leaving any information that you care to. Uh, Many things to share with you this morning, a few uh, to bring to your attention. The first is uh, Tara will be back next week. I don't know about you, but I'm like, I miss her already. (laughs) But she'll be back next week. She'll be preaching the next three Sundays. On Sunday, February 26th at 11.45 will be our annual meeting of the congregation. So that is the time where you all will be able to discuss and receive the annual report. Um, You'll receive the actual physical report prior, but this will be a time where we discuss it together. Um, You also approve terms of call for the pastor. And um, and so we, we gather together to celebrate all that has happened in 2022. So you'll receive that report and our Lenten news letter in the week ahead. Uh, I also um, want to ask, uh, want to point your attention to the Lenten studies that are taking place. We've got th- um, two very exciting ones on a Tuesday night and a Wednesday night, and then there is an independent study that you can do as well. I a- uh, ask that you remain seated for the postlude this week. That's all I'm going to say, (laughs) but I would encourage you to stay for that. And, um, And I would like to invite Mary forward to speak about new members. Good morning.
morning. Go birds. Um, the Congregational Life and Membership Committee is really excited to announce the, uh, some of our newest members. So when I call your names, if you would please stand. Um, Mary and Drew Kramer, and they have two kiddos, Gwen and Nathan, and Paul and Lauren Richards, and they have three kiddos, William, Annabelle, and Madeline. Please join me in welcoming them to our congregation. <laughs> Our first reading today is from Psalms 119, which can be found on page 566 in your pew Bibles if you'd like to follow along. Happy are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Happy are those who keep his decrees, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous ordinances. I will observe your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
As, you come, as we come into this time of prayer, I invite you to hold three families close to your heart. The first is the family of Sylvia McKee, who passed away last week. Um, Sylvia is such a longtime member and beloved volunteer in this congregation. She served in so many ways, a service in celebration of her life and in honor of Christ's resurrection will be held at Whitehorse Village on March 31st at 11 o'clock, and all are invited. Please also keep Dave and Jean Russell in your prayers as they grieve the death of their brother-in-law, this husband of Dave's sister. And we received word that Anne Powell passed away this week. Anne had, was a longtime member of First Presbyterian, and she um, still, I believe, had connections here, and so we wanted to share that news with you. And now let us pray. God of blessing, we proclaim your good news and yet acknowledge the reality of sorrow. On this day, we lift up the people of Turkey and Syria. May your peace breathe life into lives devastated by the recent earthquakes that erupt, erupt in the midst of communities already beset by war and violence. Be with all who have lost loved ones, homes, and workplaces. Strengthen and encourage the helpers and give courage to those to rebuild. We pray for all who mourn, and especially today for the children and grandchildren of Sylvia McKee, for the Russell family, for the Powells, and all who are coping with grief of estrangement, new diagnoses, or addiction. We lift up our voices for the well-being of your creation. Guide our patterns of consumption that for the flourishing of creation and for generations not yet born. Be with those whose hearts long for healing today, for all who seek reconciliation and new life, for those wrestling with pasts that cannot be changed and futures which seem uncertain. Help us to live in the truth that all our lives are held in your loving hands. We commend our lives to you, knowing that you hear our prayers and answer them according to your will. It is in Christ we pray this and speak together the words he gives us as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In peace, let us bring our gifts to God. The morning offering will now be taken.
Holy One, we offer you these gifts with thanks, that, to, that together we may plant and tend to the seeds of your new world. May we be your faithful servants as we cultivate your love. In Christ we ask this. Amen. morning. I admit that what, given what day it is, I had been kind of hoping that the lectionary would do us all a favor and serve up a good old underdog story, or at least a passage featuring a bird. Now, the scriptures have no shortage of stories of unlikely heroes, one might even say that a small but right, the small but righteous claiming victory is definitely a God thing. Though I'm not sure that our spiritual ancestors were familiar with greased lampposts or soft pretzels. Their loss. Um, in any case, let's just say that while this sermon will address anger and forgiveness and transformations of the heart, we can agree that our better angels can hold off on all of that until tomorrow morning, or at least give us a 24-hour Kansas-based exception. All right, now that I've danced on the edge of blasphemy for a little bit too long, um, let's get to the passage that has been laid before us this morning, which is a continuation of Matthew's Sermon on the Mount. In this section, we move from Christ's teachings on blessing to what scholars call the antithesis, the antitheses. Um, and the for the rest of us is, a pla is, is the place where or the stakes, where Christ seems to raise the stakes exponentially as Jesus moves from how we act to how we think and feel. But before we read scripture, let us pray. Oh God, Send your spirit upon us and light our path that we may travel the road you have prepared for us. Help us break free from ideas that no longer bring life, that we may embrace the work of your spirit. Amen. And Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, 
you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Again, you have heard that it was said to those in, of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. For better or for worse, this is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Now Christ gives us a tall order in this passage. He begins not with ethics, how we treat one another, but the inward orientations of our heart, how we feel toward one another. It is an exponentially more difficult invitation than elsewhere in the Gospels. The mandates to feed and clothe and house those in need are challenging enough given the complex realities of our world. And yet the terrain of the heart is a frontier vastly further, its landscape even more demanding. After all, how does a person live without anger or practice perfect forgiveness? Is it possible to go through the entirety of our lives without hurting another creature? How do we master impulses that are as natural to us as sleep or breath? Now, especially in today's world where we know so much about how our bodies and our minds work, it's tempting to argue that this simply can't be done. We may not talk as much as generations past about original sin, but the same general principles show up in other ways. Scientists show us how our brains, and especially those feeling parts of our brains, are crafted for survival, reptilian fight or flight. How our DNA holds on to violence and trauma, not only that we experienced within our lifetimes, but also that our ancestors experienced. The more we learn about the human species, the more we realize that so much of our way about, of moving through the world isn't simply about will or character, but rather the biological and cultural stews in which our forebears have been simmered over hundreds of years. And if that's all we are, the products of our environment with little meaningful control over our inmost beings, then we can take Jesus' words here and we can sort of tuck them up on a shelf, along with biblical guidance about slavery and burnt offerings and the place of women and all else that we often argue made sense in one time and one place, but not for all. But in case it's not obvious, I am not of that school of thought. Now today, we might have a much more nuanced understanding of the headwinds that humans face when we try to change how we think or how we feel, but we also live in a world where we see the tragic impulse of not making, uh, impact of not making those changes. So we approach a text like this with humility, but also with a sense of urgency. We say, please, God, help me help all of us live like this. We may, sitting here, have a hundred different perspectives on policy issues, on things like gun control or climate change, but I would bet that each and every person sitting here and all of those in our community is longing for people not to want to shoot up schools or dance studios or Walmarts, 
We all want to preserve and care for our planet so that it will be healthy for future generations. And we've seen too that legislation, you know, the law is important, it's critically important, but it's limited when it comes to making the world a better place. We have, um, we have to actually want our communities to be fairer and kinder and safer, or any law that we enact will fall flat. Now, wanting to live without anger or resentment is one thing, but how do we do that? And that's where interpreting a passage like this can get really tricky. Now, when I worked in a psychiatric hospital, I avoided this passage of Matthew like the plague, especially the middle verses that I skipped over about hurting yourself, taking off a piece of your body, rather than sinning or hurting another person. And I did this because there were people, there are people, who take Jesus' guidance about gouging out an eye or cutting off a hand very literally. There was more than one person I ministered with walking around without an arm, thanks to Matthew 5. And there was no one on this hospital staff, even the folks who probably would describe themselves as biblical literalists, who um, saw self-mutilation as a mark of spiritual health. We all knew that a person who did this was suffering, that they needed help. And even more, I never met anyone who experienced relief from taking this literally. Um, typically, their guilt, their self-loathing would just sort of migrate over to a different focus. It didn't improve their relationships with the people closest to them. And maybe less dramatically, the same went with thoughts. Um, my priest colleague was kept very busy with people confessing their angry or unforgiving thoughts over and over and over to him, just consumed by a sense of brokenness. And that relentless confession did not tend to produce comfort or a change of heart. It was just a very bleak and lonely and sorrowful way of moving through the world. And I don't think that is what God is asking for when we read a passage like this. So if we put a very literal interpretation of Jesus' invitation in one spot, another sort of polar opposite way of looking at the text is to throw up our hands and, to, and say, you know, what he's asking for here, it's impossible. So the point of this teaching must be for us to recognize that it's impossible and push us toward grace. In this view, Jesus is setting the bar way above our capabilities to show just how powerless we are to be righteous without him. And in that case, I could sin boldly. I could throw myself then on Christ's mercy for redemption. Now for any of us, this is a very, any of us who resist change, this is a lovely and very convenient interpretation. Um, it's heavy on grace, doesn't ask much, but unfortunately, it's not exactly kosher. The Bible is pretty clear, very clear, that Jesus is nothing if not a direct communicator. At times, maybe we'd love for him to be less direct. Um, we might not understand every time what exactly what he's saying. We might not like what he's saying. But nowhere in scripture does he set impossible hoops for us to jump through with the goal that we will fail and thereby gain faith. Now, so many of you, I'm looking out here, there's a lot of teachers here, and, um, and I imagine that none of you approach teaching with the idea that you would give the kids or the students in your care some impossibly hard lesson, because that impossibly hard lesson would teach them that they have no capability to figure it out, and they must turn to you, the all-knowing one who will help and save them. That, no, that's not how teachers work. You challenge them, you invite them to push ahead, to do things that are just beyond their current capabilities, and you give them the tools to do these things. And that was the same with Jesus. He was a rabbi, he was a teacher, and like any good teacher, he wanted us to grasp and integrate the things that he was trying to convey. So if Jesus is teaching us, He's using a very particular way of talking. And the style of language that he repeats, you have heard, but I say, um, that you have heard refers to the law. And it's a specific, very typical way of referring to the Ten Commandments because in, at the time of Christ and, and now, those commandments were so holy, so important, that you couldn't even refer to them by name. 
you would just say, you have heard. And the in the commandments was sort of this silent parentheses. So Jesus repeats this format, you have heard, but I say, and then he follows that but with a very broad, very deep interpretation of the commandment. Sometimes when Christians hear how Jesus talks about the law here, that law that was imparted by Moses, and throughout the Gospels, they hear that Jesus is freeing us from something restrictive or punitive, a law that was meant to cage us in or that was insufficient, maybe a law that was, that was the bare minimum for religious practice or human conduct. And even if you could follow it, which none of us can, what we really need is Jesus to replace it with something better, ideally with himself. Now, the trouble with this, again, and lots of troubles in the sermon, is that this way of interpreting scripture has no biblical basis. Jesus reassures his followers over and over again that he's not here to abolish the law. He says, right in the passage right before us, he says, Matthew 5, 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. Now we hear the promise of fulfillment differently, depending on where we're sitting. If we think about laws, about any kind of law, you know, religious, cult, you know, religious or civic, uh, you know, something like a speed limit as harm reduction, a necessary evil. We think that people are at base, selfish, impatient creatures, and we're going to speed because we can't help ourselves. But at the very least, the speed limit will, if not entirely stop people from their bad behavior, at least allow us to impose some consequences. Then what we get from that is that laws are needed because humans have a design flaw. We have this thing in us that consistently and inalterably makes us lean toward bad choices. Now, in that case, laws are not like a great thing, but we need them. They're especially because that neighbor of ours always tends to speed down the street, but mostly they're there to force us into doing the right thing. Now, if we take that approach, if we start there, then the law is sort of a negative thing, and it's meant to bend us, or even better, bend our neighbor, into submission. But Jesus doesn't think about the law this way. In the entirety of his preaching, he treats the law as a gift, not something that boxes us in, not something we need to follow so that we'll earn God's favor, but a key, a key that opens the door to a life of deep meaning and connection, even freedom. Rather than a speed limit, I think it's more accurate to say that the law that we find throughout the scriptures and the law that Jesus describes is more like good food given to humans who have these enormous capabilities for goodness with the goal of forming good and faithful communities. And he do, they do that by strengthening our relationships with one another. When God first gave the Hebrew people the law, it was not about individual piety, but rather a loving gift aimed at birthing this community of Israel. The law gave guidance on how followers of God were to treat each other with the idea that if we followed it, we would have an abundant, joyful, collective life. Now, even Jesus' strong prohibition against divorce, again, that was in that little section that I skipped over in the reading, um, on its face, that can be read very rigidly. It's like, wow, that is, you know, given what we know about the complexity of human relationships, um, it can seem very, uh, it can seem restrictive or even dangerous depending on the marriage. But that law makes more sense when you realize that there is this whole other side of the conversation that we're missing in the scriptures. Now, at the time when Jesus was ministering, divorce was a wedge issue for the Jewish people. It was as big as the many, many wedge issues that divide our religious communities and culture. Now, on the one side were religious leaders who said that a man, definitely a man, could divorce his wife for any reason, even, um, even ruining his dinner. Ironically, I did that this week, and you know, <laughs> hopefully we're still together. But um, on the other side were, were leaders who said, oh my gosh, you can't do that. Divorce is prohibited for all but the most serious infractions. And so when Jesus, we don't hear both sides of that argument, but we do hear Jesus coming down pretty firmly on that anti-divorce side. 
And we hear in that, and what we're invited to hear in that, is that humans and relationships are not disposable. We don't toss someone aside because they make us mad, they're not useful to us, they burn our toast. Um, Jesus is not abolishing the law, he's radicalizing it. And I'm not saying radical as in like Molotov cocktail radical, I'm saying the Latin radical, which comes from that radix, which means root. Jesus is getting down to the roots. What is the law actually intending to do, and what is it trying to create? Now, when we look at this law this way, this guidance that Jesus gives about not harboring angry anger, about reconciling with each other, it all starts to come together. It makes a lot more sense. Jesus is not shaking his finger at us for us having unkind thoughts, but trying to lead us into ways of being in the world that put us in right relationships with each other, our spouse, our community, and with God. So yes, you can say, you know, the law says not to murder, but you can have a community where people aren't murdering each other, but folks are utterly consumed by their dislike and their distrust of each other, and that would not be a very fun place to live. Similarly, if I have wronged you, and rather than go to you directly and make amends, try to fix what I've done, um, I just head up here to the altar. Maybe I have my prayer of confession, and I confess to God, and I receive forgiveness from God, but would that make the two of us okay? Um, I, don't think that you know, I don't think that you would be all that comforted by the fact that God has forgiven me if I haven't come to you with a sincere and repentant heart to say, how can I fix this? I am so sorry. Now, I don't think that 12-step programs are utterly, imperf are utterly perfect, the end-all, be-all, for addressing addiction, but I do think that they do a really good job when it comes to making amends. No one who's involved in a 12-step program can jump to asking God for forgiveness unless they've made a sincere effort to look the person that they've wronged in the eye. Likewise, when Jesus says, hey, offerings are wonderful, but before you make your way up to the altar, make sure you've reconciled with the person that you've harmed. And to that end, I'm going to ask you to do something, and before I do, it is entirely optional. There is no pressure. But if you have a wallet with you, take out some money that you are willing to give for an offering next week. Don't do anything with it. Just hold it in your hand. It can be a dollar. The amount is not important. Actually, finance people are kind of glaring at me, so like, it can be no less than $100. Um, no, just seriously, no, it's, it's really not about the amount. And if you, have a, if you don't have cash with you, just take a pencil. There's some little pencils. Write a number on there. Write a number on like a little piece of paper in the pews. Um, now in a moment, I'm going to ask you to put that piece of paper in your pocket or your wallet, somewhere where it's tucked away, but will stick close to you for the week. And in the days ahead, I want you to think about the relationships in your life that need some attention. Now maybe it's something small. Maybe it's that neighbor who always puts their dog bags in your trash can. Maybe it's something so big that a lifetime would hardly make a dent. But whatever it is, I want you just to spend some time with it this week. Let that offering sit with you on pause until you've taken some action towards your healing, or the, even if it's just burning a candle or praying about it or writing in a journal. And the next week, when you give your offering here or at the food cupboard or however it might be, I'll invite you to take a moment to reflect on what, if anything, might have shifted in your heart. Now, I am a pastor. I'm not a magician. I can't promise um, that something will happen. But I can totally promise that when we don't try at all, when we despair of anything changing, then it's pretty much guaranteed that nothing will happen. So maybe it's worth a shot. Now, I don't know about you, but I draw a lot of comfort that when it comes to faith, especially the tricky parts, we're rarely asked to reinvent the wheel. More often than not, the generations who came before us wrestled with some of the same issues that we do, and we can benefit from their wisdom. And this idea of how we allow Christ to infuse the entirety of our lives, including our thoughts and our feelings, was something that the ancient desert fathers spent a lot of time on. Now, these men and a couple women um, lived in the third century, right about the time when the Roman Empire was starting to crumble for a variety of factors, but one of them was widespread corruption. 
And at the same time that Rome was sinking into this sort of abyss of moral decay, it also, somewhat ironically, made Christianity the state religion. Um, though the thing that they were calling Christianity had very little resemblance to the actual teachings of Jesus. And in response, you know, for many people, there were people are fine with this, but there were a group of people who were not fine. And um, these folks, who we now call the Desert Fathers, fled, you know, in small groups, in ones and twos, out into the wilderness to f try to firm up the foundations of the faith with the idea that if they could reclaim or preserve the roots of the church, then one day they could return to the cities and bring back the true faith to the wider population. Now, these guys wrote a lot, um, and I guess it's because they had a lot of time out there in the desert, um, but it's so wild because what they wrote, what they talk about, sounds so modern. You could easily hear your therapist giving you the same advice on a Tuesday in their office and not realize that this piece of advice was written by a guy in a cave at around 400 AD. And one of the big things that these guys talk about was something that they called guarding your heart, which actually sounds very like protective and closed off, but it was the opposite. It was about opening your heart. And these people believed that humans are fundamentally good. Our natural state is complete union with God. But there are things in our lives, in the world, that clog the works, and they prevent us from being in union. And two of those things are burning anger and resentment. And interestingly, these people also believe that these thoughts came not from original sin, not from some character flaw, but from outside of us, from this sort of, and we can be infected by these thoughts like a virus. And similarly, there were good thoughts that we could sort of catch in the same virus way. And there were things that were just kind of in the ether, like that were neither good nor bad. They were just kind of like, what am I having for lunch today? Now, these monks did not use these words, but they almost thought of these things like radio waves. And, um, you could and you could tune into them. And part of spiritual practice was to try to tune as much as possible into the God ways, those thoughts of warmth and compassion and connection, and tune out the thoughts which block us from seeing the image of God in our neighbors. And the brilliant, the other sort of brilliant part of this is that if one believes is that badness is not core to a person, but an infection, something that they are afflicted with and we too in some part are afflicted with, then it becomes a whole lot easier to actually find compassion for that person. Paul writes that our battle as people of faith is not with flesh and blood. And in this case, our battle is not with our neighbor, but with the forces of destruction that any one of us can fall prey to. So, friends, as you go out into this big, complex world this week, know that the love of Jesus is not some sentimental pie-in-the-sky thing, but this deep-rooted force that underlies what we so often mistake as being the real world. And it is this love that holds us as we are and never stops seeking us, is never content until we are whole with one another and will follow us in all the days of our lives and beyond. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Will you rise as we, um, will you rise for our affirmation of faith? Will you please join me in confessing our shared faith? We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
May the wisdom of the Father, the love of Christ, and the peace of the Spirit shine brightly in your lives this day and always. You may be seated. Thank you. 